India is hoping its second mission to the moon will be a success. Almost 50 years to the day since the first human set foot there. But whether it's developing countries or private companies, is space a good investment? Welcome to Roundtable. Hello there, I'm Shuli Ghosh. 50 years ago, the world witnessed the first human to walk on the moon. Now, there's a new contest to land there, with more commitments from governments and more private companies joining the space race. But will these new odysseys pay off? Fifty years since man first set foot on the moon, the fascination with space exploration continues. India is stepping up its ambitious space program with a new mission to the moon, hoping to become just the fourth country after the US, Soviet Union and China to land a probe there. It wants to get astronauts on the moon as early as 2021. China's moon probe landed in January and has been sending back images from the lunar surface since then. The United States has set 2024 as the deadline to once again land humans on the moon. And it's not just governments. Private Israeli firm SpaceIL tried to land a lunar probe in April. US company SpaceX has launched its own reusable rockets and Virgin Galactic space plans are truly out of this world, taking tourists into the Earth's atmosphere. So man is once again exploring new dimensions in space, but will these new odysseys pay off? Let's introduce our guests today here at the round table. We have Professor David Southwood from the London Institute of Space Policy and Law, Graham Peters, Chairman of UK Space, and Professor Offa Lahav from the Astrophysics Group at University College London. Gentlemen, good to have all of you with us. So let's talk about why suddenly everyone is so interested in going to the moon again. Is it just our insatiable curiosity? Well, it is, I think, curiosity at the start. And uh, this is a celebration, as we said, of 50 years since the landing. I remember it as a boy. It's only, in fact, influenced me to become an astronomer. Um, and it's a sense of curiosity of always looking, searching for another continent, for climbing another mountain. I think we can't get rid of that in curiosity as humans. But then there are all these other elements of it, of actually discovering new facts about our universe and how did it start and how did the solar system form. And then there are also the element of actually developing new technologies and maybe again, discovering aspects which we don't know about, which it's, will it's take us to really the next, next isn't it? step. What could be, what could right. be achieved? But didn't, wasn't there like a, a dip in interest in, in, in going to space after all the, the flurry of moon landings back in the 70s? There was, but I, th I think there's, there's now a recognition that, that space provides so much to people's everyday lives. We use space you know, every day when we switch on our smartphones, half the applications on your smartphone use space in one way or another. So it's built into society. So people realize that and, and countries and governments now recognize the importance of exploring space and developing the technologies that used to support space missions. Okay, but there are technologies that have been developed for space exploration, which we use all the time now, isn't that right? Like solar cells or, or artificial limbs, things like that. Yeah, in fact, uh, the, other, the other day, uh, a, a proud engineer from the Canadian Space Agency showed me the banknote, the $5 Canadian banknote. And on the back of it, it has a picture of a robotic arm. That robotic arm is used in space, but it has also applications on the ground in the nuclear field, for example, and also in medicine. So there are spin-offs from space exploration, space technology, into what goes on on the ground. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, in fact, I would point out that it was interplanetary exploration that led to the development of the protocols we use every time we use a mobile telephone. I mean, this was the, this gave us the means to organize the data in the telephone calls and made it efficient, um, simply because when you're doing it from far away, you have to be efficient. So 
space certainly drives things back on Earth, but um, I think there is another reason that the Americans landed on the moon and then lost interest, because the first thing they did was put up a flag. And so there's a sense of national identity, of achievement, that other Americans shared with Neil Armstrong simply because he'd landed on the moon and put up the stars. See, that and idea of a sense of achievement and, and mm. sort of the, the prestige of, of, of being able to, to be a space power, is that why governments like India are now so keen to be part of the space race? <clears throat> I asked the head of the Indian Space Agency that very question, and he said, more or less, yes, but he put it in a different way. He said, everybody in India can see the moon. And the oh. idea that India is capable yeah. of putting something on the moon is empowering to their population. It, it's an inspiration, it's a pride, you can call it national pride, but it's something else. It's that they have the technical capability. And so India doing something on the moon is, is important um, psychologically. Is that, is that why UK is, is so keen to, to develop its own space capabilities? Well, I mean, the, the UK is uh, a big supporter of the European Space Agency. Uh, Are we, we still going to be one after Brexit? The European Space Agency is not part of the EU. There is a big EU right. programme as well, which sits alongside, and we're in the process of developing a national space programme, which will help us forge partnerships with other countries around the world. And, and that, I think, is, is also one of the... Uh, the, the very positives around space exploration, space science, is the fact it brings scientists together from different continents, different countries, to work together. And in a post-Brexit world, we think that will be a very powerful way of deepening trading relationships. You talked about partnerships there. Um, who's driving the space race? Is it private companies? Is it, is it Elon Musk? Is it Jeff Bezos? Is it governments? Who's doing what? Well, I think it's a mixture. We'll hear more from others here. Uh, but we clearly see this trend now of private companies getting into this enterprise. Who's driving uh, who? Private companies driving governments or governments uh, wanting help I think help it's a mixture of companies? individuals who would like to make their mark, like the names you mentioned, uh, Bezos and Musk, uh, there was an Israeli attempt, Bereshit, to, to land on the moon. It crashed, unfortunately, but they made it all the way. And this started from a non-profit organization called Space IL. That's, that's the Israelis. Israelis. Yeah. Uh, that's another example. So I think it's a mixture of, of, those, uh, of those, and it's probably a two-way process. Well, I think any government wants to encourage us. Well, most governments want to encourage private companies. Because and it's so expensive. Because it also introduces the idea of competition and efficiency. And so the Americans have a great advantage at the moment, having both Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. They're competing with each other. They've got slightly different priorities. This buys off some of the risk for the American government because they're sharing the risk with these entrepreneurs. Equally well, the entrepreneurs are getting large amounts of money from the American government. I mean, it's a but, but seeding how process. How do they hope to make their money back? Is it from the technologies that they're developing? Or is it because they're expecting to find some massive mineral reserves on, on, on the lunar South Pole or on as asteroids? Or uh, what is it they're hoping to find out there? They're hoping, I think, simply to be there on the grounds that other people will want to be there. Right. If you'd had a simple communication satellite in orbit around the moon when the Chinese arrived on the far side of the moon, then you would have had business because you could have provided a telecommunication service to back to the Earth. Or that there are, it's not simply wanting to mine the place, it's the belief that this is where part of our future is going to be without really knowing exactly what. It's the same motivation humans have had for exploring their own planet. Is it slightly worrying that, that 
th there is an air of exploitation here, so that it all comes down to uh, which company can get their paws on which bit of the moon first. Rather, shouldn't space be open to everyone? I, th I think if you look at um, other ways space is used, it's not just about exploitation. Of course, there will be those that, that might want to have that, you know, in their in their business plan, so to speak. But there's also the services that can be delivered on the ground to, to people. So, for example. Uh, if you take the uh, Amazon, Jeff Bezos, and launching satellites to provide internet, OneWeb is another example. This is providing internet for people in very rural areas right around the globe who can benefit from all the services, access to information that we take for granted here. If you go into the middle of, of Africa or anywhere else that's unconnected, you just don't have that resource available to you. And that can have big impacts on things like education and on health and so on. So, so there are societal benefits that come through. And of course, along the way, they want to make money. And that's one of their motivations for doing it. But also, it's about doing good for people on the ground too. Do you agree with that? I agree with that, and there's an element of cooperation among communities that usually don't talk to each other. Suddenly there's this common goal. So I'll give an example. Uh, you know, my, my own research field is actually the distant universe and the origin of the universe and what's the universe made of, dark matter, dark energy, and so on. And you wouldn't think the moon could help with that. But actually, some of my colleagues have the idea of placing radio telescopes on the far side of the moon extending similar activity on the ground. There are currently big telescopes being built, especially in South, Af South uh, Africa and Australia. So here you will have astronomers who are interested in the far universe, working with people who are interested in the moon for purposes of mining and making money. And they will actually be working together. And I think, luckily, that element is, luckily, this project is so expensive that they force nations to talk to each other. I think so it's there's a good cooperation. Thing. And we do, we're more, doing more and more now in particle physics and astronomy. We're involved in projects which involves hundreds of people, thousands of people even, from 10, 20 nations. I think, look, it's, it's also good for peace, right? People, people will actually be working. So it's kind of come back to the human aspect of looking towards a common goal. And there's a, there's a lot of interest in the far side of the moon right now, isn't there? That's yeah. where the India... Um, they were vehicles are, are, are to land, land to the south pole of the yes, moon. Yes, the lunar south pole. Uh, the Chinese I b went for this far side of the moon. Uh, it's always the far side, you know. There's this as it, aspect it, it, it that the, the moon, like... this part, the moon is kind of always faces us in one direction, and uh, so it's, it's the, the mystery, unknown. Isn't it's it? the mystery. The far side of it's the a moon. bit exploring the you know, the, the south. Southern Hemisphere in, in, in the early days. It's the same, I mean, nothing to say, I think it's the same elements of curiosity of conquering new, finding new continents, which is coming back to us now on a bigger scale. But are we seeing more, um, because we were talking about technology earlier, um, and a lot of uh, the, the recent uh, space vehicles that have got, gone out have been unmanned as opposed to manned. Are we going to see more manned missions? Well, I think. Um, the virtue of a man or human, actually, need not be man. Could be a woman. Uh, of course, um, yes. Human exploration is you're carried. Every human being relates. You, you're carried with them. I sort of feel I've been on the space station because I know people who've been on the space station. Tim Peake took me to the space station by just psychologically. I went to the moon with Neil Armstrong because I followed him. And so there's a human aspect to it that you think maybe one day it might be me, or I know how, how would they feel. Robots don't feel. On the other hand, if you're really just looking at cost efficiency, <laughs> I'm afraid it takes, takes an awful lot to beat a robot. You can make robots very clever. You can link human beings in a very safe environment on the Earth and have them explore Mars. That's what the Americans are doing, what other But as you Europeans... say, there's so much more interest when there's, there's people we can relate to. Uh, I mean, the European Space uh, Station 
the International Space Station, for example, um, uh, sorry, was one of those things where there was, uh, you were talking about countries cooperating. That was a perfect example of where lot, many different nations um, were taking part in a space Yeah, it goes project. back further than that, actually. If in the depths of the Cold War, you know, when, I, when I was at school and there was all talk about you know, Russia uh, or the Soviet Union uh, and America you know, blasting each other to bits with nuclear weapons, at the very same time, they were able to cooperate on the Apollo-Soyuz program. So you're absolutely right. It, brings, it does bring countries together, the scientists. It's a, it's a really good way to build relationships. And there's going to be the, the Lunar Gateway project, uh, which is going to be another international cooperative um, Absolutely. project. Absolutely. It's, um, it's going to be the first space station out of Earth's orbit directly. It'll be in lunar orbit. And and they're hoping to send people down from yes, yes. Well, that station a, to the surface of, of the moon. It's like a railway junction. You drop <laughs> off there and then... Uh, drop down onto the surface of the moon, wherever you want to go. Um, it's certainly that's driven by the feeling that humans have to be involved. And I think ultimately, you still have to come back to the fact you're human and you therefore relate to this. And also, humans can play very critical parts. I mean, the landing of Apollo 11 on the moon could have been disastrous if it had been simply done by the computer. Neil Armstrong looked out of the window of the uh, lunar module and saw rocks where he was due to land. He seized the controls and guided it to the horror of Houston, who didn't know what the problem was, but he nearly ran out of fuel before he found a place that he considered safe to land. Uh, you can say so what it, it should have been. been very different. Yeah, it could it. have been very different. So we're assuming that people are going to walk on the moon again. What about um, further afield? There are all these projects to try and get man on Mars. What, what do we think about that? Sending humans to Mars, potentially to colonize a whole new planet. And possibly on a one-way journey. Yes. but. I mean, is it why? Uh, yeah. Why are we doing that? Because what we've made such a mess of this planet that we're we're now going to try and find another one to call home. Well, I, it seems there are a number of things there. First, within among in the community, there are different voices, right? So there is a kind of a friendly debate. Some people think use only robots, don't you know risk humans, uh, especially for people like me who study the distant universe. You can say you know. What's the point? We can well, just, there seems to be no shortage of volunteers. No, at the same to to time, Mars. there is this element of excitement about seeing a human there and developing technology and understanding the biology, our own biology, by putting it in extreme environments and so on. So there is that, I think, there be some balance, should be some balance there, right? That, that the resources but are... But is it a good investment? Is it a good idea? What do you think? I, I'm not sure it's a good investment if you just simply look at the want a guaranteed economic return. I mean, one day this Earth will no longer function. Does that mean the end of the human race? Is that our logical end? If we have the capacity to move off this planet and live off this planet, design systems to allow us to do it, then it could extend the life of the human race. I mean, I don't know how you feel. But, but is I mean, that the goal? Is that the goal of space programs to eventually leave Earth and, and well, if you if you find look brave new worlds? Look back to some of the speeches that John F. Kennedy gave back in 1962. There was a lot of controversy around the investments being made in the Apollo program back then, and he you know, made predictions about the future in terms of how much space will be used by you know, by us, by citizens for mapping, for uh, you know, timing and positioning. But it, and he also spoke about benefits in terms of driving technology forward in terms of computers. He predicted a day when everyone would have a computer in their home. Well, now we have was right. one computer, maybe two, in our pockets in the form of smartphones. So you know, it did, I think, drive things forward. And so there will be benefits, spin-off benefits, from investing 
in these kind of initiatives, as well as the direct ones. Because the, the costs, I, I know that the relative costs of space programmes have come down uh, massively. However, they are still really expensive. I mean, India's space programme is, is, is something like two billion over a year, and that is dwarfed by, by NASA and, and by China. So why is it seen as so important to put money into uh, space programs when there are so many problems to solve on Earth? Well, I think India makes a very interesting example because it has it's had a space program for many, many years uh, focused very much on the direct benefit to India of its space program for, for weather forecasting, for actually even managing their cities. The way they map their cities' growth, because it's a very, very big overpopulated country maybe, is from space. They take pictures, they organize, everything is organized that way. And they, their telecommunications, they've been education in distant villages in the Himalayas or wherever, using space technology. They're world leaders in the exploitation of space. And I think at some point, if you feel you're wealthy enough and you're successful enough, then you need to carry your population along and take them into space, in a sense, too. By but where does it leave poorer countries who, who don't have the money of, of, of India and China and America? Well, one but hope is that poor countries can also buy shares, even small shares, participate. That's the spirit of this cooperation we talked about. Let's not forget another revolution which is going on in a big way. It's evolution and revolution of, of big data. That's everywhere, right? The fact that we have to deal with huge data sets all the way from our smartphone uh, to this, you know, television studio. Uh, it's, this is now everywhere. I think it's actually making things very democratic. So I think this revolution fits in very well with this revolution of going to space because we need all these tools to handle lots of data. And I think it is democratic, and I think poor countries would so, participate uh, in it. And, and presumably, everybody, we get a filter down effect, and everybody benefits from the, the kind of technological advances that, that, that we know. Yeah, we, we, we've been talking a lot today about the, you know, going to Mars and looking outwards at the universe. But let's also not forget the, the role space plays in, in looking down here helping to protect the planet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think everyone uh, recognises some of the challenges we face around climate change, well, not, not everybody perhaps, but climate change. Uh, the, the UK government made a pledge or a legal commitment, in fact, to zero net carbon emissions by 2050 recently. Space plays an enormous role mm -hmm. in monitoring the, the condition of our planet, understanding the science behind climate change, and, and also, you know, looking at some of the mitigation methods to, to solve climate change, the treaties which, which get agreed internationally. How do you monitor those? Well, you monitor them from space. And when something goes wrong, when there's some kind of natural disaster, is often space capabilities that are used to help emergency services and the international community respond to those disasters. So there are benefits to, to everybody. Is all of this things. regulated? Uh, this is, uh, I, I, I'm quite... Uh, I don't know how... Up to a point. Uh, is, it like, is it like the Wild West? Anyone who can build a rocket can go up there uh, and... That's, of course, causing uh, an interest in space law for many... Many years, it, you could only think of one country building a rocket big enough to go to the moon or whatever. Now we're in a different world where individuals can do such things. And suddenly, as you say, there's a need for regulation of some kind. It is otherwise the Wild West. And uh, you've got to have rules for how you stake a claim and what you are allowed to do once you're there. That's, of course, uh, part of being human again. <laughs> we have to have rules to deal with other human beings. And once space is in so integrated in our society and so many individuals can have an impact in space, then I'm afraid you do have to negotiate regulations. There have to be rules. Yeah. I mean, uh, ethical issues, I think, will come into place, yes. right? Lots of ethical, conceptual issues. There is, 
uh, allegedly Michael Collins, who was the third Apollo astronaut orbiting uh, Apollo 11, who was orbiting uh, the moon, not landing on it, allegedly he said, next time we come here, we need to take with us a philosopher, a poet, who would actually would tell us what does it all mean, right? So we need, you know, we need these other people. Uh, it's not just the astronauts and the engineers, but you know, the philosophers of the poets who also have to, to be there to guide us how, uh, how to handle space. And maybe those people yeah. will be, we will see them on the moon very shortly with this uh, uh, mass interest in, in getting more people on the moon. And he actually he said a philosopher, a poet and a priest. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed yeah. for joining me. Yeah. A really fascinating discussion. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for TRT World Roundtable. For now, from me and all the team here and my guests, bye-bye.